Hi guys, um, I'm from Victoria University in Wellington. Um, I had the lovely pleasure of being supervised last year by Guy Marriage, who's a board member of Prefab NZ. Um, how do I start this, guys? Is it going? Yeah. Cool, so uh, I undertook research looking at waste in the construction industry. Um, and as you all know, New Zealand has an awful history of waste in the construction sector. Um, but of course, prefabrication is widely regarded as a solution to this problem. Um, so we looked at alternative structure and alternative framing methods that could potentially be reused and eliminate waste in the long term. So this project's called DFAB, so Deconstructible Prefabricated Architecture. And it stems from this problem that 50% of all waste, cleanfill and landfill is from our industry. So what we did is developed this advanced structural system um, and we built a full scale prototype at Victoria University. So it's a reciprocal CNC cut plywood framing system um, and it's cut from 17 mil structural plywood, thanks to Carter Old Harvey. Um, it's fully modular, it's a low carbon, zero waste whole building solution and it's designed specifically for disassembly and cyclic reuse. Um, so what we developed was this frame that used an interwoven geometry basically um, and it looks really complicated but it's really just two symmetrical frames that come together and we detailed it in a way that enabled all of these fixtures and fittings to be joint and reversed without any damage. So what we do is we create this kind of cyclic reuse potential where all the materials retain their value throughout their useful lives. So this is demonstrating a reversible flooring fixing um, and rather than using full sheets, we break down the module a little bit more so it's more attractive in more circumstances. And so this is the key component. It's uh, a span unit um, and it's been sort of iteratively refined over time to develop a module that's really useful in heaps of different circumstances. Um, and again, so it's that module mixed with a joining piece to form this grid. Um, and I employed lots of high school labour, so this is university students assembling this over a couple of days. Um, the flooring system, again, it's just using two simple geometric modules, so it's either a 600 by 600 plywood square or a triangulated module for the perimeter. Um, and then the idea is, is that there's inherent redundancy. So in each point of this grid, uh, you can put a wall unit. Um, and so just by drilling through the floor, then we can construct exactly the same system that we used in the floor, so this reciprocal grid. Um, and we detail it in a way so it can stand up and interlock into that floor section. And so this means that we're using much less variable components. And so when the building or structure is going to be reused, or the components are going to be reused to prevent it to go into landfill, it's a lot more of an attractive value proposition. So this frame, as you can see, it sort of pulls apart into two pieces and then comes together. And so the advantage of that is it's a lateral load resisting frame, in theory. Um, and so we've removed the need to glue or screw jib to the wall. Um, and it's also self-correcting. So these external units clip on the front and they pull each component into straight and plumb, which is really useful. And so again, these flooring connections, they're designed to be literal load resisting, they hold down and for horizontal loads. Um, and they're really exploiting the benefit of the plywood system. Um, we don't necessarily need the structural steel, but for this prototype and for, let them, for, for us to let them build it at Victoria University, we had to have those steel components. And so again, the geometry, it looks complicated, but once you sort of get this process of repetition, um, the assembly is quick, very, very quick. Um, and very easy to understand. Um, they stand up and again, they pull together into real good logic. So what we did is we were looking for redundancy in all aspects of the design. So the corner detailing had to be designed in a way that enabled you know, modular expansion. So the components, we didn't want to add heaps and heaps of new components every time you added more walls. Uh, and again, these corners had to be really structurally strong and they're dealing with quite a complex geometry. So we've detailed them with steel brackets again and then these cover plates which allow the the fixing of linings uh, to the exterior. Um, and again, this is showing that integration of other more elements coming straight into that section without the need for more components. And so this included the design of a reusable waterproof lining. Uh, and so it sort of utilizes a quite a simple and traditional principle of overlapping um, plywood components um, to form what we call a sort of a snakeskin approach. Um, and it's sort of inherent principles of drainage and natural ventilation. Um, and so rather than just digitally modeling this, again, we had the support to build it. Um, and so really quick to assemble, prefabricated panels and really optimized for the available sheet material, 1200 by 2.4 meters. 
um, and again designed to bolt into that frame and come out without any damage, out any glues, adhesives, anything like that. And so the structure, again, it's not just working in verticals, it's working as a spanning element. Uh, so in this case, we're testing it as a cantilever structural element and connecting between the two walls. Uh, so the length of that structure is about 5.4 metres. Um, and we're working on a 900 millimetre grid. Uh, so the first principle is to get that one of the frames up um, and you can bring them up as prefabricated modules on the ground. Um, and then we can build the other components up there. Um, we couldn't fit a crane or a hybe or anything into the space, but in reality you could probably prefabricate the entire roof in a factory and bring it in and just dump it on to the top of the structure. Um, and you'll notice we're fixing some extra span components in there to give it a little bit more rigidity for spanning across that distance that it is. And we used some props while we were doing that just to make sure everything was going to plan. Um, and again, we've got these uh, components that are clipping on the outside of the structural frame and they're offering that sort of self-correcting geometry, pulling itself into flush and plumb. And so the module itself, it's a 900 millimetre grid, but it also divides into a 600 millimetre square, if that makes sense, on the angle. So this allows us to fix sort of off-the-shelf components such as insulation into that grid, run services through the integrated holes. Um, and to highlight that this is sort of a, a really effort to pursue simplification, um, to make it really attractive reuse proposition and an attractive simple prefabricated solution, um, it is just one grid. So all of these components can be expanded, they'll break down and they'll form one enormous grid. So you could potentially resell some of those components, you could keep some of them. It's sort of really suitable for partitioning and in commercial instances where it's getting changed often and you need to buy some more or you could sell some. And these detailing of these components, again, it's waste free. Uh, so it's designed to fit really well onto conventional sheet materials using that 600 grid module on the angle. And these spans just under 1.2 metres wide. And so these components are forming such a strong structural diagram that diaphragm that it means we can detail it in a way that you can have half modules as well. So you can expand upon that grid and make it a little bit more flexible for various uh, situations. And because the width of that end piece is uh, just over 90 millimetres, it also means it can fit quite comfortably into conventional framing. So this could be treated as a really sophisticated and efficient expansion to existing construction methods. And you'll notice there's the, been these funny little blob shapes throughout it. Um, so what they are, they're designed to basically minimum material on the building um, around the junctions that it's supplying. So in reality, reality, they could be these square modules and there could be no waste from the sheet, but would rather use that material a little bit more efficiently. Um, so this is uh, an experimental approach that I guess you can only get away with at university, but what we did is collected the waste material from the CNC fabrication that was at Makers of Architecture, um, collected it into bulk quantities, so we did about 50 sheets of material um, and then bought a garden shredder, shredded the waste plywood, um, and then tried to make some materials from it. So one of the materials that we came up with was uh, mixing natural pine resins, charcoal dust, and the chip material. Um, and there's some sort of, I guess you call them believable studies that say that could be a quite a successful cladding product. Um, and then this is a more traditional approach. So the Germans used to use this um, traditionally wood chips and clay to create insulation, but also a little bit more sophisticated hydrated lime, charcoal dust to create a much more stronger rigid block. So that could be installed into the frame and essentially eliminate all waste in that process and it's fire proof. So it sort of lends itself to these possibilities. So what we developed was you know, quite a crazy solution I guess to a waste problem but it is the first step um, and it's an interesting pursuit of perhaps something that the industry should be thinking about a bit more, the end of life issues associated with the products we're deploying. Um, it is reasonably cost competitive, I guess. It's about 20 or 30% more expensive than conventional light timber framing, but it is a different category of product, of course. It's 200 millimetres thick, um, superior structurally, um, and prefabricated, a lot more accurate. Um, so this research is gonna go on. It's gonna develop into a PhD study. So if there's anyone in the audience that is interested in further research or something associated with this, please come and talk to me. Um, yeah, and thank you very much to Karahold Harvey and Makers of Architecture. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Jed. Okay, moving on to that quick fire aspect, Robin Phipps. Thank you for coming to us from Massey, Albany. Hi, Robin. Thanks, Pam. Um, and you've got a, a clicker there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just going to present a, a few headlines of some of the research that we've got going in this space that might be of interest to people. Um, so it's just going to be sort of the real top level in terms of what it is. There will not be any p-values or any um, results presented, but if you're interested in any of these topics, please either ask myself later on or Wajiha, who can put up her hand there, or Naluka, who's, um, who's here, who, have, um, who are some of my colleagues which have been involved in some of these studies. I won't try that one. Oh, oh here. This. Oh, the green button. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, um, Wajee has been very involved with the looking at some case studies, 151 buildings across New Zealand. She's been looking at the look, benefits of panelised systems, and um, she will be able to tell you about some of the great results that she's found there with a lot of cost savings and, in particular, time saving. 47% time saving is something which I think is very incredible. I don't think that. Um, there's many systems where we're seeing that, and obviously time equals cost, um, so it's very important. There was also some surveys that were done with looking at occupant satisfaction and prefab accommodation, and again, it found some really lovely results, so Wajiha can talk about that one in more detail. <coughs> and also a state of the nation in terms of where the prefab industry was going and it found, as we've heard a lot about today, the fragmentation of the industry is one of the barriers which we will be needing to put a lot of support in around. We have done some work, MG has done some work looking at health and safety of prefab workers. Um, obviously when you can take people out of some of the dangerous conditions and not working at height as much, it will reduce safety, uh, or increase safety and reduce injury and risk to staff, and that has an impact. It flows on into staff morale, um, it reduces compensation, liability, risk, and a whole heap of other benefits that go with that. And some other work that we have been doing, where we've been looking at some of the risks that are health and safety, uh, health and safety risks that people are imposed to. We're finding that where people have been working at heights, there are some pretty dangerous practices happening, such as standing on purlins and heaving 40 kgs of materials at, at a colleague. And obviously, if we can eliminate those risks and do things where we are using scissor hoists and the like, um, we are going to reduce some of the problems of the industry. We did a project looking at health and safety of migrant workers in the Christchurch rebuild, and we found that migrant workers, and this was one of the conversations that's been had quite a bit today, is that often migrant workers are in a more vulnerable position than a permanent workforce, and they are likely to under-report um, their accidents. Either they're under-reporting or they're the safest workers that could ever be imaginable. We suspect it's that the under-reporting is, is the case because it, it, the disparity is quite huge. Um, we've, Wiji has also been doing some work looking at the export potential of timber panels and um, have found that there is quite a bit of interest in that. There's also quite a lot of people, industry players, who are talking about <coughs> doing this, but there's also people who are talking about importing. So we've got to be careful that in terms of what's the inflow and outflow of materials, um, you know, it has to be of net benefit to New Zealand Inc. And there's more research which is happening this year, so with our current stock of, of masters and um, PhD students that are happening, and um, we've got 128 undergraduate students doing research projects this year. A number of them are in the prefabricated space. We're also finding that there's um, looking at the constraints that we have got. But in particular, we've got one PhD student who's just dedicated to looking at the innovations and in terms of the housing supply chain and how this can be addressed in terms of affordability. And is um, Nishadi here to just pop up your hand? So it's sitting in the back corner. So if anybody wants to know more about that, help her. So I'm just being asked to do this license thing again. Like, okay, which one is it? Cancel. I can't see my slides though. So. 
Okay. Um, just your decision. Oh, I can. I can work it up the board. Okay. Um, we did quite a bit of work on looking at above code performance of buildings. Um, any building code is the lowest legally acceptable solution, and we've heard a lot of analogy between different industries. Um, nobody ever buys a car and wants to have the lowest amount of um, brake pad available that you could possibly get away with at the time of purchase. So we're doing a lot of work. We've done a, a prefabricated classroom where we've done one above code and one to code, and have, uh, we're doing some analysis of that data at the moment. We also tie in with construction waste, which is Naluka's field of expertise. Um, we have a, a large ongoing program in conjunction with Otago University looking at health and safety. Thank you. Health and safety in, in buildings, and we know that um, in a traditional timber stick frame match stick building, um, we uh, have temperatures that go down to minus four degrees, which is the same temperature as my freezer, and that's where a lot of people put their children for the night. We've got some work happening where we do have small and airtight buildings, looking at what is the moisture impact, especially in bathrooms. And we have a program where we have been going with a PhD student just about to complete, where we'll be using solar air heaters in classrooms. And we found um, two, two thirds of the heaters, heater use, huge savings in heater use, much warmer temperatures, better CO2 levels, as a result of having some CO, uh, some air heaters that sit on the roof of the classroom and um, just pump fresh warm air into the classroom. In Palmerston North we were getting 55 degrees out at 9 o'clock in the morning on a winter's day, which is not bad. And that's just a, another couple of photos of um, the panels. The photo on the bottom right is um, not the best way to do the duct inside the classroom. <laughs> we had words with the installer about that. Um, a student who's been doing some work on house condition surveys are finding indoor dampness as a result of lack of deferred, um, deferred maintenance and the lack of maintenance being done. And that's a, an evaluation of the house condition survey that brands have been doing. And to continue with our work on building performance, we have um, tried to overcome one of the hurdles, which is at the cost of instrumentation typically cost me about $20,000 if I was to use commercial instruments to look at some basic parameters in a house. With the thanks of support of brands, um, they gave us some funding to develop an instrument and we can do the same thing as a commercial instrument would for $500 instead of $20,000. So we're quite pleased with that and that's being used in a whole heap of schools in the South Island at the moment. And this is some of the team who are busy developing sensors and Internet of Things in order to improve the performance of buildings. We've got some work going looking at night lighting in, in hospitals and fire evacuation using virtual reality and augmented reality. And in line with that, we do quite a lot of testing on LED lights. We have a, a lighting lab. We've talked a lot about... Um, the need for innovative procurement, and one of my colleagues, Nasima Miali, is doing a lot of work on early contractor involvement, um, plain and contracts, and how do you assign that risk? And we have a master's student who is looking at, at BitChain to um, assign risks and to improve the financial performance of a project, and I'm being told to sit down. <laughs> Um, here we go, here we go. Oh, I can sit on. down. Bang on, nice. Thanks, Robin. And next we were going to hear from John Tukey, AUT. John, you're in the room. Great. John has got his um, spectacular AUT slogan behind him. He doesn't have a presentation, so that's perfect. Would you like to pace, sir? It's okay. I think everybody can hear me anyway. <laughs> but I'll, I'll Just in case. No worries at all. Um, welcome one and all to AUT. Uh, in common with uh, most other people at this time of the year, I'm an academic who is under stress. See this face? This is a stress face. I actually had a full head of hair this morning. It's that time of the year. 
And uh, what I'd like to be able to do is the organising committee, if you could arrange for it next time to be before the start of term, that would be really appreciated so I can actually be in here. Because at the moment it's been the equivalent of... Uh, a simple hello would have done. <laughs> it would have... <coughs> Um, it's been like, uh, you, you know when you, you, you don't want to hear the results of the All Blacks game? I'm kind of hearing all the press releases and seeing the stuff on the screen on my computer at the moment in my office thinking I should be down there. Very, very depressing. Don't tell me what the punchline is, you know? Okay, at AUT we're uh, fully committed to development of construction engineering as far as uh, New Zealand is concerned. When I first moved to AUT my objective was to, in effect, create a third way in New Zealand because uh, Auckland had a lot of stuff, Canterbury had a lot of stuff, and AUT was just a little engineering organisation. Uh, if you l look across the road just sitting just now, I'm not going to do the uh, photograph on the wall, you can go and walk outside. Big building out there, about $140 million worth of investment in construction engineering primarily. So, what are we doing? Um, we're, having, we're developing a significant amount of capability with regard to um, uh, earthquake, uh, prevent or, sorry, earthquake uh, mediation or or uh, design. Uh, so we've got structural health monitoring taking place. We've also got um, a restorative uh, uh, next generation uh, connection technology that we're in, the, in uh, conjunction with University of Auckland and Canterbury uh, developing as well. Some really cutting edge stuff as far as engineering is concerned. We have a huge number of students who are currently working in this type of space, which is great. Um, so we, you are going to get some more people going forward. It was very noticeable, I saw the previous presentation talking about some of the deficits that we have within uh, New Zealand. One of, the, one of the principal deficits obviously is in uh, investment in the space, you know, and everybody is hanging out waiting for the commitment and the investment to take place as far as uh, prefabrication is concerned for the future, right? We all can all see it, we all know it. Uh, when it comes to skills, we're trying to make that investment now. And that's what we're in the business of doing just now. So it's literally a work in progress. So I can't show you anything because we're just about to do it, which is a bit of a blow. Now, the good news is, because I haven't got uh, slides to play to, that means I, I'm going to be relatively short and to the point. <laughs> there's always something behind you, you know. Um, the good news is because there's no slides to play to, I don't have to uh, get uh, sucked into uh, trying to explain every, every individual detail of every project that's taking place. As it stands at the moment, the principal features for us, structural health monitoring, um, connection technology, next generation to connection technology, and uh, the then process-based stuff related to um, logistics, supply chain management, procurement, and waste minimization, waste reduction. They are our fundamental uh, approaches. More broadly, we've been engaged with the um, National Science Challenge, I'm sure you've probably heard of. Uh, hopefully, you've probably heard of. Um, crickets. You've not heard of the National Science Challenge. Somebody's heard of the National Science Hey, 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 excellent. Um, National Science Challenge is an interesting proposition at the moment. My contract is on hiatus, so I don't want to talk about it. Not that I'm you know, not bitter and twisted or anything, but where's the money? Show me the money. Um, there's a lot of work that's taking place, though. The, the, the National Science Challenge objective is, is actually to re-engineer re and rethink the construction sector across the board. And that's both ends. That's on the technical side of life, um, you know, doing better technical solutions, but also rethinking and reorientating re the uh, expectations of society. At the moment, the fundamental problems that we're faced with are... are Substantial. We're building the wrong types of build, we're building the wrong types of home. They're very large, they're not particularly efficient, and they're built from first principles. We get that, and you know fundamentally we need to shrink our thinking, uh, in the sense of uh, trying to achieve quarter acre living in a quarter of the space. That's basically what the aspirations as far as National Science Challenge is concerned. The uh, from a social perspective, that's a challenge because. Um, most people tend to think, yeah, fine, I'm all for urban densification, but not in my backyard, okay? Um, and that's, and that's the, the issue. I, one of the nice things about what, with the, uh, the latest sort of uh, interest in tiny homes and so on is literally actually in my backyard. So there's an irony there, uh, as you do. Anyway, that's, the, uh, that's basically where we're at as far as... Um, uh, uh, AUT is concerned on how we're dealing with the construction sector. This time next year, I'll have a whole lot more to talk to you about. 
but it, literally we are in a work in progress at the moment. As a final thought, what I'd like to say is um, it's great to see you actually here, um, and uh, I hope you've uh, thoroughly enjoyed your time here at AUT, and we've extended all the hospitality that we possibly can. Um, do take away the message, the fact that we are fully committed to it. And by the way, this, uh, this, this new building, you're going to see some seriously good engineering coming out of that in the future. Thanks for your time. Okay, great. Um, David Chandler, now I'm pleased to invite you up from the University of Western Sydney. Are we driving from here? You're opening that up so I can use it live. Here you go. I'll use this, I don't want to use this. Okay, great. Hello move, again. saying move away, Pam. Do then. Uh, hi, everybody, and thanks, Pam, for having me back. I think this is the third time over four years, so you've been quite indulgent of, of me. Um, let me just tell you that there's a context to what I want to say. I've really tried to put some notes together listening to what's going on today. But first of all, buildings are getting smarter. Clients are getting smarter. It's expensive to retrofit smart. You need smart procurement, smart delivery and smart operations. And you need a smart workforce. Now, I'm not an academic, but I'm increasingly becoming a problem for academics because I'm becoming like a walk-in ARC grant and when you walk into a university with a pocket full of cash, you get their undivided attention, let me assure you. So that was always the premise behind what we're doing. This is not an ad for Western Sydney University. It's an ad for what is possible. And that's the message I want to leave it with you. And what we've done at Western Sydney University, as far as I'm concerned, the IP around that business model is entirely available to every one of you. You just need to ring me and I'll send it to you. Now, I get out of bed every day, but my Jacinta statement is that I get out of bed simply because I'd like to see the construction industry a lot better placed before I crawl into the long box. I became really motivated about what we're doing about three or four years ago when I went around and interviewed a half a dozen of the senior construction lecturers at the major universities in Australia and said, have you graduated a game changer in your program any time in the last five years? And the 100% answer was, no, why? And I thought, shit, that's pretty scary. So three years ago, I came here and I spoke to this, a group like this, and I spoke about what the problems were. A year or so ago, I came here and talked about what we ought to be doing about it. And today, I'm coming to tell you about what we are doing and what we have done about it, because that's a different ball game. I want to tell you about this project called the Centre for Smart Modern Construction. Again, just a name, IP is available to anyone in the room who wants to copy it. So it's not exclusively that, but let's call it that. Uh, it's essentially an industry crowd-funded investment program in an academic setting. The model's based on organising 100 small to medium-sized enterprises to commit to 20 grand a year for three years and we end up with a pocket full of $4 million. Well, I can tell you now, you get the Vice Chancellor's attention with $4 million in your pocket. We launched it in August last year, and we're just about at $750,000. We'll have a million dollars before the middle of the year. We've got a business plan that says what we're going to invest that money in. So the people who are putting money in that program are putting it in against these initiatives here that you'll see here. Can I make that go up or not? Pam, can I do that or not? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's all that's going to come up. So um, you can see that we've got a business plan that simply says we're going to invest in five things, very simple moving parts in this business plan. We're going to invest in research grants. We're going to invest in bringing the best academics to our university for short-term sabbaticals so that they can infuse our academic staff with evidence-based examples of what's going on around the world. We want them to come for four to six weeks and supercharge our academic team, share it with our undergraduates and be available to our investors to actually provide in-house masterclasses to them. 
We're going to have academic exchange programs where we're going to send one or two of our better academic teachers away for a month a year and put them in a hotspot so they can come back and rant about it when they get back. We've got an undergraduate scholarships program for high achievement undergraduates uh, and that is going to essentially provide the last two years of fees for the better high achiever students. The first two of those will be this year. We're not interested in providing grants at the beginning because you had a hole in your cardigan. We actually want to provide grants for people who get it, who are excited, who've got good academic scores and have got high potential. And finally, we're investing in, we've had to change the name because of Ma Pam's pleading. Uh, we, we're going to call it a co-lab, but it's actually called a smart build lab. And it's a full scale construction site, roughly 30 metres by 30 metres, going to sit three metres above the ground and it's going to have the capacity to take two and a half bays by two bays by three storeys high, full scale construction in steel, concrete and timber. And we're going to throw one of those up every six months so the industry and the academics can use that to uh, move forward. I'd just like to really just say to you that most of this was inspired by what Pam's done with this organisation. It's about actually getting a collegiate group of people together who actually see a problem and actually want to invest in a solution. So we've now got our industry collaborators. Is that going to work? Hopefully it is. Is that going to work? So as they're coming on board, we've got industry collaborators. We're going to actually demonstrate a real debt of gratitude to those people. They're the people who were the first movers. They're the people who got the first $600,000 in the money box. Let me tell you about the money box. This is what's really pissing some of the academics off, is that we've negotiated a money box that no academic can get their grubby little hands on unless we hand it out. It's exclusively for this project. So it's not put the money in the door and wave it goodbye. It's put the money in the money box and make sure we do what the industry wanted us to do with it. Boy, is that getting some resonation with people who are prepared to partner with a few hard-won shackles. So here's a list of people and if I click on the next level it takes you to the websites and, and if I clicked on the Hanson Yunkin one it would take you to it would take you to uh, an interview with Hanson Yunkin and tell you why they see a future for modern construction, examples of projects of what they're doing and messages for undergraduates about the sorts of things that they should be mindful to do as they're doing their program. So money talks and bullshit walks. So we put $200,000 on the table in November last year to fund for research projects. And we said, oh, by the way, the industry's priority is these areas of research. So the first thing we were told is, oh, no, 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 it takes two years to get a research program approved at a university. You'll have to go through the process. I said, but we want to do these four here and now. They said, oh, no, 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 that doesn't happen like that at university. I said, OK, we'll put the money back in the money box and I'll do an article for the Sydney Morning Herald to say you guys couldn't use $200,000 of industry money on research because you've got no bloody idea of how to get it done. Well, two weeks later, two weeks later, we had all four projects approved. And guess what? They were so shamed by the process, they matched it with $160,000 worth of university money. So our project went from 200000 to 360000 Here they are. They're advertised right here and now. Um, they're, they're out. They're closed in another month. So if there's any PhD students out there looking for something really intelligent to do that's relevant to what the industry wants, here they are. First project is look at the opportunities for the digital economy to approve the cost of compliance and construction. Let's stop all this duplicated crap and see if we can find a digital solution that's going to improve the cost of doing compliance. Second one is how do we, how do we actually come up with a ubiquitous global measure for construction effectiveness? Let's not have all this, oh, I'm faster, I'm better, I've got a much better quality. Let's forget all that. Let's come up with some sensible measures that actually reflect what construction effectiveness is. It's a very exciting project. Third one is, let's actually investigate what the typology of modern construction enterprises is going to look like. Let's go around the world and find really good examples of the companies that are leading the way, companies that have got a robust value proposition, have got a robust implementation strategy, companies whose business is growing 
and are actually making an enduring difference in the industry. Let's go and create an overview of what the typologies are of smart modern construction projects because it's terribly important to share that with undergraduates before they graduate so they've got some idea of the fact that the world's not going to be the same in the future. And the fourth project, I've probably got them out of order, there's five projects, I'm sorry. The fourth project is, um, probably the fifth project on this list, I'll go back to the first one because I did miss it, um, is to say, well, we've got an idea that says you can't do modern construction projects unless they're done by a modern construction enterprise. Clients who think that you can go and hire Joe Blog because he's the lowest price and he's got no idea and he thinks he can reinvent it from project to project, we want to come up with evidence-based data that says you can't get modern construction projects out of a company that isn't a modern construction enterprise. Don't need to bore you with that. Uh, the first project that I probably glossed over that we've already appointed um, the first candidate for is that we actually want to do a digital chain of custody for the collection of all the carbon inputs into a building. We want to move away from theoretical calculations of Green Star and all these sorts of things that are done at the front end and say, but what, what really happened? So we want to create a digital chain of custody to collect up all the carbon. So when Australia sends all its coal to China and sends all its steel and iron ore to China and says, oh, but it's over there and we bring back clean steel, we actually want to bring it back with the entire carbon footprint with it so that when it goes into the building, you just can't make all that go away like rubbing your tummy with vanishing cream. <laughs> so, then here's the next one and I'm going to, just uh, one more after this one and then I'm going to shut up. Uh, this whole thing, as far as I'm concerned, you know, <laughs> I have a real battle with academics because I go and sit in the classroom and actually soak up the student experience and I write them an email and I say, that was shit. <laughs> no wonder people are leaving your class, it's as boring as shit. <laughs> and you deserve to be talking to an empty classroom. I'm the only one doing it, but it's not, it's not appreciated. <laughs> but I'm going to keep doing it because I'm only interested in the future constructors. I don't give a shit about people who aren't prepared to put up a better product to the people who are going to build our future world. Take no prisoners there. If you're not up to teaching them really good stuff, then retire. And let's bring on some people who really know what they're doing. And I think we're going to attract them. So right now we've got the first of the High Achiever Scholarships. They close in a couple of weeks. Um, we're going to have two this year, four next year, six the year after. We've got 15 applicants this year. That's great because we're actually, the contractors are going to see the first of these people and we're going to create our interest in the fact that the industry wants high achieving graduates. And you know, we're going to graduate at our university 1,500 new constructors by 2025. Boy, won't it be great if there's 10 or 15 of them that are game changers. The next Dick Dusselvor, the next Albert Jennings, the next Sir John Holland. Imagine if we had five or 10 or 20 of them coming through. Boy, we'd tear this place apart. So what we've done in our news section is there's a narrative of what's going on. Um, here's one that says, where do young constructors go to hear about amazing careers in construction? Well, you go here and you'll see a narrative down here and this will get longer and longer and longer, right? Because we've got a story to tell, but we're including in the story our industry supporters and partners and we're using their organisations as a way of telling the narrative, the opportunities. Companies like Strongbill that you can go and work in, companies like Oztrust. And we can actually say, guys, this is not bloody futuronics. This is stuff here and now. And when you leave here tomorrow, when you graduate from here, you should be able to put your pedal to the metal and make a difference. And what's interesting is that the Western Sydney construction economy is 70% small to medium enterprises, of which 50% in Western Sydney are in fact enterprises that are in construction. So 50% of 70%, 35% of all industries, in enterprises in Western Sydney are small to medium sized enterprises in construction. And guess what? 
We have got the largest construction program for the next 20 years in Western Sydney that there is in the whole of the country. Our population's the same as Singapore and our population's the same as New Zealand. Western Sydney, it'll be the third largest economy in Australia within five to 10 years. So we've got an opportunity to grasp a disproportionate of national construction activity and have a legacy industry. So the whole vision for this thing is that our graduates will become the leaders of modern construction enterprises in Western Sydney, around which we can build a industry hub that is durable, and it'll all come from the fact that we invested as an industry in their future. So it might be a slightly different presentation to you about the academic engagement, but I'm afraid I describe this as a bit like Troy. When I spoke to a whole bunch of academics about this to start with, they said, oh shit, Dave, we've been trying to get the university to put some money back in for years and years. We've been banging on the dean's door. And, someone, and your hands have worn out because you've been banging on the dean's door. I said, mate, let's go and fill a horse up full of cash. Kick on the door until we've got a horse full of cash. They open the bloody door and we're inside. And we're stopping all over all of the bullshit that used to go on. There's a couple of people who still don't get it. I reckon they'll move on shortly. <laughs> because I don't, I'm not going anywhere. I'm on fire and I've got a money box. <laughs> if you've got a money box, you keep. Thank you. That was great, David. I'm glad um, that we can be honest, that we're here amongst friends, we can be frank. Um, no Kevin. No one I was expecting a podcast. Well, we're doing some video. Hi, Rob. Thanks very much for doing such a great job. Um, Kevin, you're next. Apparently, um, yeah. And uh, that's your great button God. there. All right, thanks, Pam. Um, I have to say it's been a wonderful day. It's far exceeded my expectations. I already don't know what this says about my expectations, but it's been fantastic to hear everybody speak. And it's really an honor to be up here to even be amongst the company that, that's here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing at Victoria. I feel like I have two things going against me today. One, I'm one of these academics. Two, I'm one of these fucking architects. So. <laughs> Um, I'll try to work within that and see what we can do with it, um, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, we're trying to do something, we're trying to rethink a little bit about the things that you're dealing with at, at Victoria. Uh, we're using a new, some tools. Um, I have a tool there. Um, it's a robot. I've been suddenly become the robot guy. I don't know where the name came from. It just so happens that I know how to use a robot. It wasn't a term that I was after. It was really me seeking a tool to try to change some of the methodologies, to try and change some of the things that were happening in the construction industry, and really try to redefine prefab a little bit. Um, this was talked about earlier today. I think it was Daryl was talking about um, um, the fourth industrial rev revolution. If you look at the slide and you look at what's going through it, um, really we're kind of sitting in New Zealand, if we're lucky, at the second industrial revolution. We're trying to get into the third. The fourth right now is so long, far out of sight, but um, hopefully it's on the radar and something we can get to within my lifetime. Um, so what we're looking at at Victoria right now with the robot and the things that we're doing is the third industrial revolution is this idea of using machines and computers. And what we're adding to it is this idea of mass customization. So how do we get out of mass production and start to use these machines to be able to mass customize things? And this is done not only with the tools of the hardware, but tools uh, with the software as well. There's some advancements in software that allow us and the students, everybody to start using parametric software to allow changes in the whole workflow and the design of the system. So now we can start doing bespoke in the same manner that we're starting to do um, mass production. So I started with the robots in 2010. This was in the Middle East. Um, these are videos, but I'm not going to play them because it'll probably take up too much time. Uh, this is not very really innovative. This was started in, in Switzerland at ETH. It was mentioned earlier about them using uh, the robot to build brick walls. Um, what they were doing in, in their factory is building a brick wall, using brick, using new types of epoxy to put them together delivering it out to a site, and you'll see it um, here, um, and using them as prefabricated screen walls within a, within a system. So the idea with the robot is it can make this, lay this brick down faster than a human can in any orientation anyway, and we can quickly program the computer to do that. So we could produce these walls 
quickly, just as quick as mass production. All right, and then we get some beautiful results. So what they're starting to do is take a common material that we understand and we know and we've built with for centuries and now redefine it using the tools that are available to us with uh, the contemporary software and the contemporary fabrication tools. Um, so we're starting to explore some of these ideas at um, Vic. We're in the early stages. We've had the robot for two years. Um, we've got some master's students coming through this year, and I'll touch those programs just a little bit. One of the first things we did with it was what's called incremental forming. This is also um, a movie that I'm not going to show because I know I've only got five minutes or so. But with incremental forming, what we do is we put a tool on the end of the robot. We put a sheet of aluminum. Um, and we program the robot to push on that sheet incrementally to form any sort of shape that we want, any three-dimensional form. So with this box that's here, um, we were able to get it to deform uh, over 140 uh, millimeters. Uh, we were able to take a 0.7 millimeter piece of aluminum and deform it in any shape. And being tied to the parametric software, which is the key to mass customization, we can change this shape almost instantly as long as that is programmed uh, at, at the beginning. Um, so what I'm doing with master students, we're starting at fourth year level. We're teaching them to use the robot. And they're now researching year-long projects with the robot using some of these tools. Um, this was a master's project two years ago. It was the first thing that we did. So what we did was they ended up re designing that jig that you saw, and parametrically designing this. So this is what you're seeing in the software. This was each panel is one off. Each one is different. It's programmed to change incrementally. So all they're really doing is designing the system. So this talk about systems design is really key here, about getting all of these tools to start working together. So they're designing the system in the software, which will then output to the hardware, which in this case is a robot to start creating an actual physical object. So it's a very simple tool here. Um, it's an aluminum arch um, with the panels. Each panel is exactly the same size, comes from the same uh, form, but each panel is different and just bent a little bit differently um, based on the, the model that was put, put in there. We went further and started exploring some of the joints with um, 3D printing, so we're starting to use some 3D printing technology as well. Um, this year, I have a student fin finishing up with what's called freeform 3D printing. So instead of using printing in a pretty standard uh, system where we're layering it down a fraction of an inch at a, at a time, we're now printing in the air to create structure th with the robot. So uh, these are also videos, but um, we're paired up with the School of Design, who has designed and manufactured our extruder for the robot, the tooling for the end of it. And um, this year, the student's exploring um, how to create some of these structures. In this instance, they're all plastic. We're just using them, the standard plastic filament, but we're interested in taking it to a new material, taking it to other means of production. So right now, we're just kind of exploring uh, the beginnings of these things and laying the foundation to some of this research. For me, this is all prefab. Like that, the creation of that plastic wall is no different. I can create. 10 different ones because it's tied to software and I can create, create them as quickly as I could in a mass produced system. So this year is an exciting year for us. We're starting on um, some of these projects are starting to take fruition. Um, we're looking at some robotic prefab panels, um, some timber joints based um, with the robot carving and creating these joints, um, continuing the freeform printing with another master student. Um, and we're also working with XLAM on a, on a mysterious project that hopefully we'll have more at some point to, to talk about. Um, just like Paul did for XLAM, I'm going to do some advertising a little bit. We have 120 master's students. Every year, all 120 of them are looking for a project to research. So if there are partners out there that are interested and they have an idea, they don't have the time to research these things, come and talk to us at university. We, we have the ability to spend a year researching these things, even if it's an idea you don't think has a whole lot of legs. right? We can put students to work and give them ideas, give them the research topics that sometimes they're struggling to find. So um, it's an ideal partnership. It's an ideal situation. It's something we should be doing a lot more of, because they're going to benefit from um, the real world uh, advice and, and projects that you can bring to the table as well. So I think that's it for me. Well, that was great. Um, and it was good to open the session with Jed's piece about his 
uh, full interactive physical sculpture structure out there because we're ending this piece with the other piece out there, Yusuf and Gemma. Um, are you both here? Oh, great. Come on up. So Yusuf and Gemma are from Unitech and they've created the Kata Hot Harvey Wood Products installation out there. So Gemma, you're flying solo? Yes, I am. Well, okay, it's all yours then. Cool, so hi everyone, my name's Gemma um, and I'm on my fifth year of my Masters of Architecture. Um, and today I'm gonna take you on a little journey of what we've been up to over the last year. So we've had a, quite a close relationship with uh, Carter Holt Harvey and the journey starts with a student's perspective. Uh, a quick paced fabrication class um, as, a, as a third year student myself, we were tasked with an interior fit out at Tech Futures in Newmarket. Now as a group we learnt new software, understanding implications within the design. Uh, we used rapid prototyping, um, laser cutters and a CNC machine to produce this. We also had to work with a client and we had to um, perform within time constraints um, to produce this piece here. Now the next adventure we undertook was the Design X. Once we had an established set of skills, there were, we then applied this to a one-to-one -one situation. Now the one in the back there is a um, prefabricated cabin, so that was uh, one third of a um, built project which we put up in an hour and 45 minutes. And the best part about it is there was four girls that, um, that we cut it, uh, one girl designed it, and we built it all by ourselves. Now the Design X, um, it was a celebrated um, uh, display that we had there. Um, we also had the pods, which are along the side there, which take quite a long little journey, which I'll take you through in a second. Now, with the development and skills um, and engagement with the products that we had, we did have um, an opportunity to be a part of the Festival of Architecture. Now, as for myself, I was originally always a student, and this time around I um, stepped up and I became the project manager for this one here, which was, I was tasked with dealing with third and fourth year students, um, and there was about 25 of them. Again, it was all fabricated via a uh, CNC machine. Um, now the next one, ah, the pods. So the pods came back again. Now this was the final iteration that we had um, that they are now sitting down in Tapuna, which is our main hub down in Unitech. This time round, as you can see, there's a few little bits of greenery. Now what we did is we teamed up with the landscape department um, to put this together so that then the local cafe, just out of sight of the shot, um, could actually use this to grow their herbs and harvest them daily for um, their uh, food and whatnot with that one. Now this design here has just gone into the Life and Style magazine and it has come out this month. Um, and this one here we were all about um, trying to use the material um, sustainably, um, cut to the parameters of the sheets that we had. Um, now the next part here, this was um, just the summer gone. Um, so I stepped into a new role, a very unfamiliar role. Um, I had big shoes to fill. Um, I was entrusted with a group of second year Bachelor of Architecture students. Um, had to put my big girl pants on with that one and I had to step up. Now with this one here, um, we went through the process as I had done before previously in the years by learning the different types of software, laser cutting, um, running the CNC machine and multiple prototypes. Now with this start here, I did have brand new um, second year students so they'd never been introduced to Rhino, they'd never really used the laser cutters by themselves and they certainly had never had the chance to operate a CNC machine. Um, so with that, they individually experimented um, before coming together on the group design process. So with the basic skills that they had, um, they then put together the elements that they liked to try and build the installation out, the, out in the foyer there. Now this gave the, some of the students the opportunity to actually learn the software and run a CNC machine themselves. Um, so we have a total of two students that come out of this one here that can run the CNC by themselves, which actually cut the display out there. Um, now with this one here, the, oh yep, our prototyping which we went through, um, it was really, really key. This, this design here has to travel all around New Zealand, it has to be able to be broken down, um, moved the length and breadth of New Zealand um, in a van. So the thing, we can't have um, joints degrading on us. Um, it had to be, the tolerance um, had to be interlocking, so it had to be very, very tight 
Um, so that took quite a lot of prototyping with the CNC to get that correct. And also the weight as well. The weight behind that on there, um, myself and one of the Carter Holt girls, Jess, we have to be able to lift this by ourselves. So as you can see, those ones there were really, really heavy, um, so we had to reduce that one. Now, the final design that you've got out there, it allows for an interchangeable layout. Um, it's dependent on site, so we can obviously make it larger or smaller. Uh, the today, the one out the front there is actually only half of the installation. Um, so at the bigger exhibitions, we can increase it. Um, and Oh, there, just the modules. So the stool that you can see out the front there actually breaks down to three, and all, this, all the drawers come out of it. And that there to the left is um, all of the stand together. So as you can see, we've only got half out the front. So just this one here. Um, I'm <coughs> proud of the products that we produced. Um, I'm grateful for the support um, from my lecturers, from the sponsors. It wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be able to do it without you guys. And also as well, just from the woman in fabrication part of things, um, look out because we've got some more builds coming. So thank you for listening. <laughs>